Ah, that's one of the things that I was going to say. So as the session is being recorded, if you don't want to be seen, please switch your cameras off uh, now. So for everybody that's here, I'd like to welcome you all to the first Barley Community Seminar of 2024. And it's my pleasure here to introduce um, two speakers today, Hannah Simkova and Pavla Navratilova from the Institute of Experimental Botany in Olomouc in the Czech Republic. So by way of introduction, Hannah completed her master's at the Mendel University in Brno and followed by a PhD in genetics at the Czech Academy of Sciences. And she moved to the IEB, the Institute of Experimental Botany in Olomouc, where she's worked as a group leader since 2017. Um, for most of Hannah's scientific career, or latterly at least, she's been associated with the laboratory of, I guess, my long-term friend and colleague, Sharislav Dolothel, who many will know as a pioneer of plant flow cytometry and a founder of chromosomal genomics. So Pavla has been using flow cytometry and a range of other technologies, such as optical mapping um, in genome sequencing and gene cloning projects in different serials. And our current studies include understanding three-dimensional chromatin organization within the nucleus and the identification of cis regulatory elements which control gene expression in the barley genome. And I, I think these are what you're going to talk about today. So before I go on to Hannah, I should introduce Pavla as well, who will come hard on Hannah's heels. Um, and Pavla's followed a bit of a more complex path towards working on plants. Um, spending time in Norway, where she looked at the mechanisms and evolution of transcriptional regulation and genome organization and epigenetics, actually, in both zebrafish and chordates. And on returning to the Czech Republic, she joined IEB, and where she's transitioned to plant genomics, concentrating primarily on barley as a model crop. So Pavla has focused on the genomic organization of gene promoters and enhancers, sequences that are crucial for the transcription um, of individual genes. So, as we said, just in the introduction there, we'll take questions at the end of both presentations. So, can I ask you, if you're in the audience, to please use the chat box function to write down any questions that you have during the presentations or write them on a bit of paper um, so that you remember who and what you want to ask at the end. So, um, as the session will be recorded, I've said before, please switch off your cameras if you don't want to be seen. And now it's over to you, Hannah, please. So, Robin, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I will start my talk uh, uh, by a question because I realize that this is uh, probably the second uh, talk from Olomos in the last uh, seven months, which means that uh, we really mean the barley research in Olomos. Uh, we take it very seriously. So, I just wanted to justify why this is happening. So the first question is very easy because the question is uh, why we do actually barley research in the Czech Republic. And I'm sure that everybody knows the response is because the Czechs are really very good in beer drinking. And barley is uh, uh, the one of the main components or malt is uh, the main uh, component of the uh, beer. So uh, with the per capita consumption of 135 liters per year, we are the world leaders in beer drinking, and this is reflected by this high density of breweries and uh, microbreweries uh, shown here on the map. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the full picture, let's say, in a worldwide comparison, but here we compare with uh, Slovakia, because here this part is the Czech Republic, and this is Slovak Republic, Slo Slovakia. So you clearly see the gradient that really the density is much higher in the Czech Republic. Uh, but the uh, oldest and uh, largest breweries are located in the western part, in Bohemia. While the barley research is nearly completely concentrated in the eastern part, in Moravia, and specifically in Olomouc. So then uh, that's, a, that's the question. So why, why uh, really, why exactly in Olomouc specifically here? And to answer this question, we need to go back uh, to the history, uh, deeply to the history, uh, because the cultivation of barley has very long tradition in this region. Uh, getting back, uh, dating back to the 19th century or even earlier, because this is the uh, period uh, that is attributed to the emergence of a legend about uh, a king 
uh, about a mystic, mystical savior of the Moravian country, a king whose name was Yechminek, and Yechminek, if translated into English, can be translated as a barley boy. In German, it's easier to translate. It could be Ein Gelsthen. So, and uh, this this name uh, should commemorate uh, the fact that the king uh, was born in a barley field. So, uh, uh, if it's true or not, uh, it's not that important. Just uh, this legend itself uh, reflects the fact uh, or indicates how important was barley for the local people. So the uh, and this uh, this legend is uh, situated here to this place close to Iskropinje. Uh, the the second link uh, go is uh, goes to uh, to the Czech famous Czech breeder Josef Boma, uh, who spent most of his life here in Hrubčice, the breeding station, and uh, his uh, biggest achievement uh, was generation of barley cultivar diamond, and this was a product of uh, radiation breeding. And um, I'm not sure if you know that uh, this cultivar uh, gave rise to more than hundred other cultivars that are grown uh, worldwide and uh, the uh, the uh, radiation or the irradiation induced uh, a large inversion in chromosome 7h which was quite intensively studied in both the barley pan genome and the pan transcriptome project so it's good to know where it comes from and uh, the last link, uh, specifically justifying the genetics and genomics done in Olomouc, is uh, the uh, proximity of the birth, birthplace of uh, Johann Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics. So it's now clear that uh, Olomouc was predetermined to body research. And the flag here uh, indicates the location uh, of, the, uh, of the institute and specifically of the Center of Plant uh, Structural and Functional uh, Genomics, where we work. This is the whole team, and uh, I specifically highlighted, uh, highlighted the people from my group, Pavlana Vratilova, Shimon Pavlu, Zuzana Tulpova, and Veronika Hermanova, who uh, were involved in, this in the research that I am going to present right now. So currently, uh, we are most uh, interested, or we work on um, clarifying the gene transcription uh, and its regulation in barley. And specifically, we are interested in the cis regulatory elements. To explain what I'm speaking about, uh, of course, the best known uh, cis regulatory element is the promoter, which uh, may get into contact with another sequence which may be quite distal from the gene in the genome uh, as far as 100 uh, 100 kilobases or even more and this can be this distal these elements uh, can be or enhancers which stimulate the transcription or silencers that silence the transcription and uh, in this whole action, there are other players, of course, uh, such as uh, media mediator proteins, uh, chromatin remodelers, and mainly transcription factors. And is the role of the enhancers to bring the transcription factors to the proximity of the promoter. Sometimes uh, this connection is uh, bound by a cohesin. And in animals also, there are other players involved, which are enhancer RNAs, but we are not yet sure how it works, if, uh, if they are important or of the, if they uh, play any role in this process in plants. Uh, the enhancers and silencers can be located both, both downstream and upstream of the gene. And also speaking about the regulatory sequences, so uh, some in a broader sense, even the five prime UTRs and three prime UTRs can be uh, considered the regulatory sequences. Uh, I am mentioning them because all these sequences are now generating uh, quite a lot of interest uh, among researchers, but also um, have shown quite a big potential for the, for the applied research and for breeding applications. It's because the, specifically the distal regulatory elements were found overlapping with uh, expression QTLs as uh, described in these papers. 
and uh, even more interest is now uh, let's say focused on uh, the proximal elements core promoters and uh, the five prime utrs which appear to be a promising uh, target for bioengineering and I was especially excited about these two papers that show that uh, these modifications or the editing in promoters can be used to, uh, let's say, uh, let's say uh, find, to find uh, up or down regulation uh, of the genes or for uh, coordinated upregulation of multiple genes. And these are really papers from last few months, so th this means that this is the trend now. <clears throat> but if looking at the titles, you can see that most of these uh, papers come from have been done on maize. Uh, also, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of work has been done in wheat. Uh, but uh, if speaking about barley, so it's really just a very small amount of non uh, data and very let's say limited knowledge about uh, these elements uh, in this definitely important crop. Uh, in our study, we focus both on the promoters uh, and uh, the enhancers, uh, but uh, if we uh, decide to study promoters or the five prime UTRs, uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, delimiting these regions to recognize uh, the exact positions, uh, position of these regulatory regions in the genome. And this is not that trivial as it appears to be, because uh, the annotation is not always reliable. So that's why we opted to use uh, uh, a specific technique that targets the transcription start sites. Uh, the technique is called uh, CAP analysis of gene expression uh, or CAGE. And this, uh, this is an affordable technique that defines position of the transcription start sites uh, with a single base precision. Uh, here is a detail of the workflow. I won't really describe all of, of the steps. What is important is that uh, uh, you probably know that the mRNA is kept at the start and the cap can be biotinylated, which can be then used to uh, the pull down of the biotinylated cap by streptavidin, uh, which uh, makes enrichment for the uh, starts of the, of the mRNAs. Uh, the uh, cDNA is then um, uh, used to uh, generate a strand-specific RNA library, and this is then uh, sequenced by Illumina. Uh, the resulting uh, reads, or, or we call them tags, uh, are then mapped to the reference sequence. They form such uh, tag clusters, and the dominant peak in the cluster is considered to be the transcription start site. So we generated this type of data for three stages of embryo because this was the main object for uh, our current project. So it was developing embryo at eight and 24 days after pollination and also germinating embryo at uh, four days after germination. And uh, more recently, uh, we added uh, this uh, also because we realized that uh, the picture would not be complete if not looking at also the uh, the, the other stages. So the inflorescence sense seems to be especially important. So we uh, produced RNA from this stage and sent uh, everything to the or sent it to the DNA form company who did the, the cage as a service for us. And now we are waiting for the data for the inflorescence. Uh, of course, first we were interested uh, about the match between the uh, uh, cage defined transcription start sites compared to the annotation as in the uh, most recent uh, reference genome in Morex version 3. And as you can see, there were quite a lot of discrepancies between the start sites uh, identified by cage and those identified uh, um, in the annotation. Uh, you can see that uh, just 39% uh, were located in uh, in 20 base pairs distance, which is quite okay because some uh, promoters, some types of promoters, uh, have not uh, absolutely are not uh, this, uh, extremely strict in the uh, possible start of the transcription. But if looking at the other parts, here you see that 29% were within 100 base pairs distance, which is probably not the same cluster, and 32% were more than 100 base pairs far away from the annotated start site. Uh, so uh, I am not going to say that what we see that this should be now the, the 
correct positions of the transcription start sites because during the analysis we observe a phenomenon which is called promoter shifts uh, promoter shift or alternative promoters, uh, which means that the position of the promoter can change during the uh, during the development, and specific stages uh, use a different promoter. And so, one of the explanation of the of the discrepancies between our data and the annotation may be that. Uh, the, the annotation, of course, was also based on transcriptomics data, mostly RNA-seq, uh, but uh, they used mainly tissues like uh, leaves, roots, while uh, we focused here in this experiment specifically on the embryonal stages, which are just marginally uh, uh, comprised in the data set used for the annotation. So we will know more about this after analyzing more stages because maybe then we found that uh, those annotated ones are, uh, uh, let's say, identified in other data sets uh, that we uh, possibly generate for a cage. And you can see that the, that the deviation goes in both directions. So there is not a bias, let's say, that we show uh, more distant uh, start sites. Uh, the phenomenon of the promoter shifts is definitely um, interesting uh, also from the biological aspect because uh, here I show, uh, yeah, just provide you an idea how frequent are such shifts. So realize, uh, the, you should realize that we were uh, analyzing quite close stages and still we observed let's say something between uh, one to two hundreds if comparing particular stages of course the biggest number of shifts was uh, observed when comparing the most distant samples it means the earlier embryo and the germinating embryo so and we expect that the number will increase if we uh, start uh, if we compare more distant stages hopefully we will know this soon and uh, the, why the biology? Uh, this, uh, uh, these two cases demonst demonstrate that this uh, sh uh, promoter shifts or maybe alternation can have uh, quite um, important impacts because in the first case of a kinase-like protein, the shift of the promoter between the stages means that uh, the later stage uh, uh, transcript uh, loses nearly a uh, whole uh, five prime UTR, so which can mean that it may be potentially missing some uh, translation uh, information. So uh, this definitely will have some impact, and this here is even more dramatic because this uh, promoter shift or alternation, this this shift, it's two kb distance, in fact, and it means that. Uh, uh, this, this shift means exclusion of the first exon. So it means that different protein is produced from the, uh, from the early embryo compared to the older developing embryo and from, from, um, with the germinating embryo. Uh, this is all I will say about promoters because the uh, major part of the promoter story, which was recently publi published uh, in this paper, uh, will be presented by Pavla. So I will move to the enhancers, which uh, are much more uh, difficult to identify or to delimit because in the promoters, we at least we that it's it should be upstream of the gene. But in case of the enhancer, uh, the, the, the distance of such an element is really unpredictable. So uh, and uh, frequently, the uh, the enhancer does not interact with the nearest gene. It can be really it can be several genes between the enhancer and its target gene. So the the possibilities how to identify these regulatory elements is uh, that uh, we may do some uh, genomics comparative analysis and look for ever evolutionarily conserved non coding sequences, and then typically the people uh, who wish to identify the, the enhancers do um, epigenome profiling for multiple features like open chromatin. Uh, then uh, they search for activating histone marks such as H3K4 methylation or H3K27 acetylation. Uh, 
Uh, they search for unmethylated regions, if speaking about cytosine methylation, and possibly we can also search for enhanced RNAs, which we did, but uh, now we need to interpret the data so as to be able to say that, yes, look at the enhanced RNAs. Uh, so here you see the data set we have generated for the embryonal stages and for inflorescence. This is just, uh, yeah, we just started with generating this type of data. So we see that we generated uh, ATEX seq data to uh, track the open chromatin regions. Uh, we did uh, chip seq for three histone modification, both the activating and the silencing. Um, uh, chromatin marks, we did net cage for the identification uh, of the enhanced, uh, enhanced RNAs, and we did uh, bisulfide seq to uh, analyze cytosine methylation. This was done just for this stage, the other ones uh, were done for uh, all stages. And besides, we also have this high chip data that show the interactions or for interactome profiling. Uh, all the data have been integrated and, um, and Alexia supported JBrow's database, database that we generated for this purpose. And you can see here that we can see all the features in the context of the genomic sequence and uh, in the context of gene transcription, because we also integrated available uh, RNA-seq data. Here are our, our cage data. Here is the open chromatin showing the peaks here, for instance. Uh, the um, uh, histone modification data are presented uh, specifically here uh, in a condensed form as uh, chromatin states, which are distinguished by colors. The black regions correspond to, to the regions of uh, unmethylated, uh, to the, the unmethylated regions, which seem to, which appear to be very specific sign of this uh, active uh, chromatin regions and but we can also visualize uh, the particular um, uh, uh, cytosine methylation in a particular context and if looking at the picture so here this region is obviously um, uh, a hot candidate for having this uh, this this uh, regulatory impact because uh, especially in this one stage we can see uh, the activating histone marks, we see here the peaks of chromatin, uh, peaks of open chromatin. Uh, we see this very clear unmethylated regions. But you can see that this region is located between these two genes. And now, uh, without having additional data, we cannot say if this possibly regulates this or this gene or another one, which is, so let's say, 200 kb far away from this place. So for this purpose, we generated the, the interactome data, uh, just briefly to describe the technique that we used. Uh, in principle, you can identify the interactions across the genome using the uh, 3C technique high c which identifies the, the interactions worldwide. But it would be very expensive to use this technique for uh, such a complex genome such as barley. So we needed to do some enrichment so as to be able to a high resolution analysis for a reasonable cost. So for this purpose, uh, we uh, combined the high C with uh, enrichment uh, for specific proteins. Uh, and the technique uh, uh, is called high chip. And the targeted proteins uh, are typically, for this purpose, uh, the deactivating histone modifications or the silencing histone modifications. Other people use, for instance, RNA polymerase for the enrichment. And this way, really, you re we reduce the uh, complexity of the sample and really could obtain high resolution information of 5 KB for a reasonable uh, cost. So this, as I mentioned, the data we specifically focused on this H3K4 methylation and uh, generated the data for the uh, maturing uh, embryo of Morex. So this is the result of the analysis. This analysis identified more uh, than at the 5 KB resolution specifically, uh, identified more than 8,000 interactions uh, whose mean distance was 121 KB, median distance 60 KB. 
I should say that this is uh, definitely biased towards the larger distances because uh, with the resolution of 5KB, we cannot identify proximal interactions uh, of segments that are closer than 10KB. So that's the limitation. But anyway, in a, a big bar, in a genome uh, with the size uh, such as of that of barley, uh, most of the interaction appear to be really on a larger distance. Uh, we frequently observe multiple interaction, uh, interactions for a single promoter. The record holder is this, pro, uh, this gene coding protein uh, term time form coffee. Uh, the, the name comes from the fact that uh, it's active in uh, uh, midnight or late night because it's a circadian regulator. So, Probably this explains why so many interactions. Uh, so, but of course, for us, the most important was the fact that we really managed to assign many of these regulatory regions to uh, their probable or their likely target genes. Here is a general uh, information uh, about the interactions because we try them to classify them to look what uh, what are actually the links, which regions are linked by these interactions. And to our surprise, uh, the major part of the interactions was promoter-promoter uh, interactions, which um, is a kind of contraintuitive because we expected first, before getting deeper into the problematics, that uh, we will predominantly see interactions of promoters with some distant regions, which may be the possible enhancers. But after going through the literature, mainly from animals, we uh, found that these promoter-promoter interactions are very frequent. And in fact, this, this, uh, this interaction can support this uh, uh, occurrence of these transcription factories uh, where the uh, coregulated uh, genes that use the same type of transcription factors cluster in some, at some spots in the nucleus. And this could be reflected by their frequent interactions. Alternatively, and this is also reported in the literature about animal promoters, enhancers, that promoters of one gene can act as enhancers for other genes. So uh, we definitely want to go deeper into this problematics because this seems to be quite interesting. Uh, here, otherwise, uh, most of the of the interaction really uh, um, affected or involved the promoters. Just this small part was not promoter linked. So uh, here you can see the result of the of the integration of all data that we generated. Uh, the most data were generated for these two stages. So here you see the number of regions associated, associated with particular feature. Uh, and uh, of course, we wanted to propose a robust, uh, robust candidates for the regulatory sequences for the regulatory regions. So that's why we were uh, trying to intersect all the data sets and uh, uh, by intersecting all these features, including the uh, the, the interactivity data we count uh, we came to uh, sorry we came to a set of uh, 1754 uh, robust um, enhancer or silencer candidates and we were able to link them with uh, their predicted target genes. Uh, we have not yet done a functional validation, although definitely this is the plan now. Uh, but uh, the, when looking at some cases that were identified as the putative uh, enhancers, which uh, or silencers, uh, which is, uh, for instance, here for, we looked for the uh, putative. Uh, cis regulatory elements for this uh, three helix transcription factor GT gene and for this gene um, our data proposed total of six uh, distal regulatory elements and uh, Pavla had a closer look uh, what they look like uh, and uh, she looked at the conservation of these elements in uh, four grass genomes and uh, you could see that uh, Three of them look very promising uh, in terms of conservation because uh, they are also uh, they were also found in this uh, in the other grass species, 
the most promising was look this uh, CRE4 and uh, Pavla looked also uh, um, when she had these genomes aligned so she looked into the alignment and she observed really conserved regions that are uh, binding sites for three transcription factors so although we have not yet a direct proof uh, that this is a really functional element so we are convinced that uh, really this is a strong candidate and we believe that after having the functional validation so that this will be confirmed and at least we know that we are on a good way that what we are identifying by our means uh, should uh, make sense and that, that that this really could be the play any role in the regulation so to sum up uh, the this first part of uh, our presentations uh, i can say that uh, we uh, generated the base precision data for transcription initiation start sites uh, for several uh, issues uh, that can be potentially used uh, for annotation improvement i would say uh, it will be even better after we collect a bigger or, or we generate a bigger collection of the data for the other stages, uh, a kind of a promoterum atlas, uh, which uh, has been generated for human and for uh, several animal genomes. Uh, then we identified these interesting uh, shifts or alternative promoters, and this is also something that we want to, want to uh, investigate in the future. We generated tissue-specific genome-wide profiles of several epigenome features and uh, activating chromatin interactions for Morex. Uh, the data uh, have been integrated uh, in a, a GBROS database uh, that we established and we identified uh, a set of 1754 robust uh, candidates for regulatory regions active in the embryonal stages maybe what i forgot to say why the embryonal stages uh, is because at least based on experience from animals there are much more uh, interactions of enhancers and promoters in this uh, non-differentiated stages compared to the adult stages so that's why we selected the embryonal stages for the identification of uh, enhancers and what we plan for the future of course uh, we uh, we work on the inflorescence data uh, we plan to perform the detailed uh, analysis of the promoter enhancer and promoter promoter interactions we want to clarify the role of enhancer rnas uh then the as i mentioned uh, the uh, candidates should be validated by bioinformatics approaches we plan to do genome-wide atex, atex star seek and also quantitative luciferase assay in valley protoplasts and of course after um, extending the database of the, this data uh, and after publishing the data which we hope to do this year uh, the browser will be made accessible for the Bali community so thank you for listening and uh, now I pass the floor on to Pavla who will continue with a more detailed information about the promoters Okay, so I will stop the sharing now because we need to change the presentation. No, ty to nemáš. No, ty si osvěžila, ale to bude tak to. No, tak zkusit to. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you see my presentation? The Barley Core Promoter Room? Yes, we can see your presentation. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I I was happy to hear all this in summary from when I was a really great presentation of uh, what we do in our group to understand where and how the transcription is regulated. 
Um, and I wanted to get a little deeper into the heart of all this, which is, in my view, is the core promoter, um, which is a platform for the for the uh, pre-initiation complex. Um, I don't, yeah, she mentioned and explained nicely the, what technique we use. We do use cap analysis of gene expression, which provides us with the very first nucleotides or the text from the beginning with the very first nucleotides of every transcript, every molecule that is transcribed. I have to point out they are stable transcripts, which is important, I think. Now, uh, let me, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, this initiation of transcription, it's a very basal process, but I felt like it's a little less understood in plants than in animals, because animal core promoters has have been studied for, um, yeah, at least 20 years. And uh, there is a there is uh, this understanding uh, that uh, that the transcription initiation doesn't happen at the, at the really single nucleotide at the initiator, but rather at the cluster of nucleotides, which might be narrower or it might be broader, um, broad more or less broader. And this breadth of uh, of initiation cluster. De depends or relates to the sequence architecture of the core promoter and it also relates to the type of the gene which is driven by this promoter and it's also if people notice that it's also connected to the composition of the of the known motifs and also it relates to the epigenome which is uh, which is uh, which is forming the the chromatin at the at the promoter and they even found that uh, they can categorize tissue specific genes, housekeeping genes and developmental genes as having certain um, configurations of promoters. And we don't know whether this is true also for plant genomes. Uh, so we performed the cage and we delved into the analysis of cage data with uh, Shimon Pavu, the, our PhD student doing bioinformatics. Um, with, so most of the analysis is done by him, I have to point. Um, so here you can see the, the scheme of, um, of the result of the mapping of our page clusters of cup analysis of ex gene expression, no, from, sorry, tags, not clusters. So the, the result is the, these clusters. This, review, this shows the, our three, three developmental stages of Bali and and the genes or genomic feature structure. So when we mapped all these tags, we got clusters which are broader or narrower. And we can see, as Hannah pointed, that sometimes we find more clusters related to one gene or when we annotate uh, every cluster as being the nearest to the promoter of a gene, we can sometimes find there are two or three. Uh, in extreme cases, there is a shift happening between the stages. So sometimes there is uh, one cluster at some position in one stage and a different position in another stage. And she also introduced you to, yeah, to the number we, we found, which is really interesting, I think. Uh, for us, it was important for our further analysis to, to define the consensus clusters. That means to really define which of these is the primary one, the one which is the nearest to the annotated uh, transcription start site. Um, so we defined these consensuses for uh, throughout all the stages. And then we sorted the primary and the secondary clusters, uh, which are related to the same gene ID. Um, on this annotation, on these annotation bars, you can see all uh, cage clusters that we annotated or we collected or consensus clusters. Then the primary ones, which of course are mostly uh, annotated as promoters and the secondary ones. The secondary ones um, fall into a mixture of genomic features, all from the UTRs through exons, introns, and uh, down to the distal, uh, distal uh, annotation, because the annotation is hierarchic, of course. Uh, so we consider these secondary um, transcription starts uh, being a mixture of unannotated promoters, uh, secondary promoters, or like alternative promoters, um, non-coding RNA promoters and also some enigmatic transcription products or even uh, recapping events. 
Um, so to, to somehow analyze the sequence architecture of the promoters, we, we asked, asked help for help uh, at, the, at the group, Bioinformatical Group, which is working in this topic for many, many years. And they developed uh, recently a new approach to analyze core promoter sequences, and it's a bioconductor package called SecRHR. Um, this method is, uh, uses supervised, unsupervised learning approach based on chunking and, and iteration, um, iterative processing for, for clustering the sequences by different core promoter sequence architectures. Um, there is a, a big advantage of this SecRHR procedure uh, and that is that the sequence motifs uh, are analyzed considering their length, positional specificity, and also in the interrelationship between different motifs all simultaneously. So as for the result from this software, um, is this, this is this complex pictures, but it, uh, it shows simply nine distinct clusters of sequences around initiator of these primary um, gauge clusters, or we can call maybe already core promoters, and the secondary clusters. Um, you can see in the middle the initiator denucleotide, which is commonly uh, contained from pyrimidine purine sequence. And uh, we analyzed minus 50 and plus 50 base pairs around. Uh, here you can see the annotation, and we we'll, it also, um, it ranks all these clusters by the promoter or the cluster width. Uh, we can see ranking also by TPM and tissue specificity. Uh, in detail, uh, we can look at the primary clusters. So by this analysis, we found that uh, roughly 20% of all promoters contain true data box sequence, which is located um, between 30 and 30 or 28 and 35 base pairs upstream the almost strictly CA uh, initiator. And the remaining of the promoters is data less, but it often com contains VBOX sequence in the same position as the data box. Uh, but then it, um, it's initiated not from CA, but often or very frequently from CG initiator. The, the other uh, uh, motifs uh, in these non-TATA promoters were formed by low complexity, often C-rich uh, sequences. Um, and uh, these box, box plots also show us that the TATA box, TATA box promoters are of higher exp gene expression, uh, with this one. Um, they are narrow, they are very narrowly uh, defined, meaning from uh, very few base pairs. Um, they have high tissue specificity. And as it goes down, uh, the promoters are of lower, uh, lower expression, lower tissue specificity, and also they are much broader, broadly defined. So to understand uh, the functions of the genes, if they are in any relation, if there is any, we performed the GoTerm analysis, uh, which in summary revealed that uh, the Tata box uh, promoters drive as we know already, tissue-specific genes, but also uh, probably respond to the stress. And non-TATA, whereas non-TATA uh, promoters drive developmental and housekeeping function, um, or genes playing these housekeeping, housekeeping and developmental functions. Mm. We also looked at uh, some specific um, gene groups uh, that we pulled, that pulled down from, uh, from uh, uh, barley genome annotation, GoTerm annotation, or GoTerm annotation, yeah. And um, looking at these, we found also interesting groups uh, which are biased towards data box uh, promoter um, initiation, which, which was the hormone responsive genes, which are driven by data box. Also, um, histones. We think these are uh, tissue-specific histone variants, most likely. Uh, but non-TATA promoters drive rather like Maxbox, Maxbox genes, which is developmental, uh, but also ribosomal proteins, which uh, perform housekeeping functions. So it, it added up on our conclusions about uh, these gene functions. Um, when we looked by like 
different uh, bioinformatical approach at the at the motif composition on in core promoters of Bali, uh, like individual motifs. Uh, we and clustered these. We found uh, this 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 three showing or this, this three shows us um, that roughly half of the motifs um, are related to Tata Box, but they are not always Tata Box like. They are often very low complexity TA uh, sequences, and uh, these we in include in the V boxes. And the other half are those C rich low complexity sequences. In general, these sequences are very difficult to annotate by particular transcriptional factors. So, um, yeah, we see just a few like E2F and the TBP, which, which are really confident. Um, the low complexity are really difficult to trust, in a, uh, to be honest. And we, as we expected, some uh, very well defined core promoter motifs, you know, to be drawn from this analysis. And we found none here. We tried also, uh, we tried also, oh, I don't have a slide here. We tried also like biased approach and looking for uh, previously known animal motifs. And we found really none except for the Tata box. So as the, corp, as the promoter an, uh, activity is also strongly dependent on the epigenetic uh, landscape of the promoter, we decided to in, integrate also uh, DNA methylation uh, information, information about uh, post-translational histone modifications and about the open chromatin um, by ataxy. But we also wanted to look at how these pro different coma promoter categories interact. So we analyzed the high chip data that uh, Han Hannah um, has mentioned or she described. So unsurprisingly, the promoter, the, the promoter regions were open of open chromatin. Um, but when we looked at nucleosome positions, particularly, we found that Tata box and non-Tata promoters are uh, distinct in, uh, in, in a minus one uh, nucleosome position. Tata promoters have very distinct minus one <coughs> nucleosome. Um, the DNA methylation uh, was more or less the same, except for the CPG DNA methylation, which, which was almost like triple at the non-Tata promoters. Uh, and surprisingly, unsurprisingly, we found uh, enrichment in acetylation and K4 trimethylation as for every uh, active uh, transcriptional active region. But uh, what surprised us was that we also observed uh, enrichment of K27 trimethylation in, in a proportion of Tata box uh, promoters, uh, which we, we hypothesized that, they, that it might be related to the tissue specificity of, of these. And as for the interactivity, uh, as Hanke mentioned, there is a roughly two and something uh, act, uh, interactions per gene or per promoter. And when we when we looked at the at our promoter categories, we found a marked difference between Tata box and non Tata uh, promoters, where it was markedly higher in the non Tata promoters. Yeah, uh, transposable elements have also some influence on the transcription, uh, especially in plants. So we looked at the transposable element overlap. And again, uh, there was a striking difference between Tata and non-Tata promoters. So the non-Tata promoters are almost triple times uh, more frequently overlapped with uh, non-transposable elements from Bali, with no specificity towards any of the of the species of transposable elements. So overall, we've drawn this um, preliminary model where we where we are able to. Oh, it's a little bit off. I'm sorry for the for the shifts, but hope you can uh, read from that. That the the Tata box promoters in Bali are mostly focused sharp, the same as in animals. They are initiated from the CA dinucleotide. And they have less; they are less interactive with distal elements. Uh, there is an overlap with K4 trimethylated uh, nucleosome or histone. Uh, it's acetylated as for uh, every promo active promoter, but there is sometimes also K27 trimethylation overlap. Um, the housekeeping 
and we don't have distinction for these two categories, but uh, we think that the developmental transcription factors have similar promoters to the housekeeping genes, but there is more there is markedly more interactivity for the developmental gene promoters. And both these categories of genes are driven from promoters with mostly CG initiator uh, and with uh, a lot of low complexity CRH sequence in, uh, in, uh, in their sequence pattern. Uh, these promoters are bro uh, broader, they are initiated from many uh, places. Uh, so our all our data, as you can see, the, these as you can see these 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 all these categories, uh, both primary and secondary uh, promoters are now summarized in a single uh, concise um, table that we published together with our article as a supplement, uh, which everyone can access and download and look for their their uh, favorite gene to learn uh, much precise information about the transcription initiation, real transcription start site, including the uh, initiation level, including the, the width of the, of the promoter or, or the initiation cluster, um, including whether it's prime, whether it has some alternative start size or not in the three tissues. And we are hoping to extend this for the inflorescence and maybe more barley tissues in the future. So in conclusion, as I maybe will already repeat what Hanka has said, but it's worth it because the cache techniques is a is really great tool for support and improvement of genome, genome annotations, including the alternative and non-coding transcripts. And the barley core promoter architecture types are related to gene functions and epigenetic profiles. Um, the data sets it is, provide, is provided for the community use. We are also hoping to include this in our uh, J browse uh, browser, which will be uh, published in the future as well. And we are planning to um, test uh, promoter activities in the transient reporter essays in the future. So thank you for the attention. Um, I will thank here not only to you, <laughs> Barrels and my group, but also to Sarvesh and Boris Lenhardt, who are from the MRC London and who helped us really with this, particularly this analysis. Um, and now don't hesitate to ask questions, both Hanka and me, about the, about both the enhancer cis regulation and promoter, core promoter architecture. You can even contact us by email later. I'll be happy for that. Fabulous, thank you very much. Well, for both of you, I think we'd probably give some applause. I think that'd be quite a good thing to do. Um, for both of you, actually, could you turn your, your um, presentation mode off on the screen so we can actually see you? Mm -hmm. Can't really see everybody at the moment. Ah, that's better. So, um, for both of you, actually, there are questions in the chat. And um, I'm going to start with one that I asked, and then I'll go on to others that other people have asked. And um, if you're listening to the questions and you've got any, just put them in the in the chat if you want me to read them, or I'll look for hands up. But I can't see everybody's hands up. That's the problem in the view that I've got on the screen. So, um, a question for Hannah. And I, I've asked the question in general terms: Are there genes in transcription factories comprised of multiple? Are the genes in transcription factories comprised of multiple promoter promoter interactions co regulated? So, so you are asking uh, if, uh, in fact, we have not investigated it yet. And in fact, in plants, there is not that much evidence about the transcription factories. I know that uh, uh, people working on wheat do suggest or do provide some evidence. But we, uh, Pavla is now going with Shimon to look at the co-expression of those genes that have the promoter-promoter interactions. But we have not done any conclusion about it yet. Yeah, it's just you showed very nicely what the genes were along that. Um, we know, we, we know, we have now the information which genes are linked, let's say, or have chromatin contact, to be precise. Yeah, it's, I guess the, the point I was going to ask or point out was that you could look at that co-expression quite easily on, I think that it released a question further on where um, you could look at that quite easily in the Morex co-expression database yeah, that's yeah, uh, yeah. available here. 
Yeah, we are going, in particular, we are going to do VGC analysis. Uh, we are going the sophisticated way, so it will take us some time, but yeah, this is definitely the plan. Okay. Um, so both Craig Simpson and myself asked a question about, had you any thoughts about how you could integrate your data with the extensive gene expression data that's available from OREX? And that kind of addresses the previous question as well. Um, and, and Craig's pointed out that the MoreX expression database or the gene expression database for barley is also JBrowse and it could be possible to incorporate the data that you presented into that database so that the expression and the um, the chromatin modifications and structures are also presented in the same database. I don't know if you thought about that. Either of you? So, so uh, I, I was reading the question, sorry. So I was not really focused on what you were saying. <laughs> so no, that's was all right. The... Most people ignore me anyway, so it's, uh, it's no difference. <laughs> and no, the I question, got trapped by the question, so. The question was, have you thought any further about how you might integrate the data that you've generated with other data that's in the public domain, which looks at gene expression across multiple tissues and genotypes? So, so we do have the the expression data. So we, uh, in principle, we can uh, integrate everything into the browser. So, so far we have just those stages, let's say, or uh, expression just for those stages for which we have the the epigenome data. But it can, it can be expanded uh, once we get generate uh, data for other tissues. So definitely we will. Uh, uh, integrate the information or on the transcriptomic side because this, uh, yeah, all of this data needs to be uh, viewed in the context of the transcription because this is important. Okay. Yeah, we know there are other browsers uh, out there where we could just feed the data, right? But um, for us, it's important to visualize, especially the interactome data, and we found no other uh, browser which is available at the moment where we could collaborate and do, and do visualize our data. So we decided that in, in collaboration with Elixir and with the group in Česká Budějovice that we are putting up our own most updated JBrowse 2 interface, which is the most nicely uh, visualizing these things. So it's maybe for the sake of like the beauty, and the, you know, but we would really definitely like to integrate as much as possible. So like centralization here would be wanted, but it needs maintenance. It needs uh, updating. It's difficult to, 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 to coordinate way oh. too many people into such a project, but we're hoping that our browser will be out there soon and will maybe attract others to, to add theirs. We'll see how this develops. Okay. That's fair. Um, there's some other questions from different people in the chat box. So yeah. Joss. From IPK, do you want to do you want to ask your question, or do you want me to do that? You can please go ahead. So, um, Josh Shippers from IPK asks, um, the genes that have got a core promoter which lack a Tata box, are they actually expressed? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, they are expressed. They have a high expression level. It's okay, also so they're not, uh, oh, they're not low the, confidence genes. Yeah, on the boxes, on the box plots, they are the highest expressed genes. And we also uh, repeated our, or performed our analysis, I believe, with with only high confidence genes, and okay. it's similar. It doesn't really make much difference, but yeah, to have more overlap with uh, or or more complete um, um, relation to the annotation, we included low confidence genes in our analysis. Yes, there is both high and low confidence uh, genes considered in our analysis because there are many which are true. We know okay. that. Mm -hmm. So, Craig, you have a question for Hannah. Do you want to ask? Yeah, I see the question. So, the question is interested in your thoughts on shifting starts promoters, how this may affect presence, absence of UORFs, ORFs. So, uh, uh, in principle, I think it can affect, uh, but uh, I, uh, so it's my task for future to uh, look more of this problem, uh, these problematics, because I saw such a paper describing uh, this problematic in animals. 
and I don't know how much is known for plants. In fact, one of those um, papers showing the, the editing for the five prime UTR uh, specifically manipulate this uh, upstream ORFs. So I don't feel qualified qualified to to let's say to make any conclusion about that. But I expect it can play a role because if you lose nearly practically a whole uh, five prime UTR, so. In such case, I would expect that this would impact even this UORFs. Okay, um, Luke, do you have a uh, question? Yeah, uh, uh, really nice talks. I was just wondering if you had a chance to check how conserved the promoter and in enhancers sequences were across the band genome. Unfortunately, we cannot say this because we don't have uh, the data for the other accessions. So, if we had money, so we can do that, but uh, it's a question, I don't think it uh, makes much sense or Pavla can conclude because she's a fan of uh, artificial intelligence and she thinks that everything will be predicted in the near future, so without additional data. <laughs> um, the, the variability across the pangenome? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's, this question. that's, uh, that's, yeah, very, very nice uh, idea and uh, I, I believe it will be done in the future for sure. I'm, sh I'm sure. And uh, it, any, animals or humans, it was found that there is actually more functional uh, variability in this, in distal cis regulatory elements. So even there, we must look and it, in the future we will, for sure. That, that's what we want to do. I, I mentioned that uh, one of the approaches to validating the uh, the uh, enhancer candidates is looking into the pan genome and pan transcriptome data and that's what we are going to do to try to find any correlation with the variability in the candidates and the expression so mm -hmm. after doing this analysis i think we, we will be able to tell you more if there is this correlation or not because something similar was done for the promoters for the pan transcriptome paper but i think that uh, uh, just uh, uh, focusing on promoters may not explain everything as also indicated by the data but we believe that if we combine analysis of both the promoters or variabilities in the promoters and uh, our candidates for for these distal elements we can get more complete picture maybe we will ask you then for help with uh, uh, let's say analyzing this complex data set but uh, yeah th this is the plan we would like to do that that would be very nice eva do you want to ask your question or shall i read hello can you hear me yeah, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because I see a student working with the Barley embryo, and um, I'm interested how was the um, the procedure made? Because in case of eight uh, and twenty four uh, day after pollination, the um, tissue was the Barley embryo. Which Hello. But what of uh, the further stage of the development, which was that four day after germination, when already yeah, the in team, so and the radical and that pulmula, which is that um, new leaf, they were manually just removed, or you have any yeah. protocol used for it? Or? Yeah. So for the embryos, these were prepped from the from the seed. Um, so yeah, basically it's a micro manipulation work mm. for, especially for the eight days after pollination, it was of course time consuming the morning work, but we made it clean, um, from other tissues, uh, and the day, day, four days after germination was germinated. And then only the, only the, the seed was removed, the, the leftover of the seed was removed, but we included both the root and shoot. Uh, which was already, of course, uh, popping up. Okay, so whole whole plant, yeah. Yeah, so it's a it's much more complex tissue. Quite sure. big, yeah. The the, mm. the embryo was already quite big. It's for a day, yeah. It was, so. of course, the biggest one. <laughs> okay. So, so Eva, that is more a, complex. Yeah. It would have been a yes. complex tissue, but actually, that tissue has been used in a lot of different um, transcriptomics mm -hmm. experiments. So. There's maybe a lot of data uh, to start to mine there. Mm -hmm. 
In effect, we 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 okay. use your protocol for the for the sample. It co uh, corresponds to your uh, uh, embryo sample. So th this is identical because uh, we, we are using your da the data from the project. So okay. So Chandra has asked. Yeah, I was question. just curious if it was maybe manually removed or is the whole plant uh, how it looks? Yeah, that specific time. Okay. Thank you. So Chandra has asked a question in the chat box. Um, He's asked me to read it, so here we go. Thanks for the great talks. Um, I hope you have done bulk RNA seq for the cage analysis. If so, what do we learn from this data about different cellular identities that may have different three dimensional architectures of the genome in the embryo? So you can probably read the question as well. Um, yeah, yeah, because, yeah. because there's quite a lot to get your head around in the question. Um, uh, of course, we, we cannot uh, provide any information for our cell types, uh, and uh, in fact, we realize the complexity of the tissues, especially uh, the, those uh, if, if they were used for the for the interactome analysis. And uh, in fact, we generated uh, also data for the germinating embryo, which we just mentioned is much much more complex tissue than the developing embryo, and it was visible in the result because for the it was more. Lord, uh, for for the for the for duck embryo because uh, due to existence of uh, occurrence of more multiple cell types we got uh, <clears throat> much less significant contacts so which indicates that this is really a complex sample and uh, it would be optimal to do it on a single cell level but this would be terribly expensive so and also the the let's say information from the single cell approaches is rather limited so we didn't go uh, this way. Uh, especially not in this type of, of tissue, but we were thinking about pollen or, or this type of analysis, which would be really highly specific. Thank you. Listen, everybody, it's 10 past three here, 10 past four in Europe. And um, we're kind of coming to the end of this. Can I just ask if I can't see everybody on my screen, but if you have a question that's not been asked or not put on the chat, would you like to just pipe up? And ask the question. I'll give you two seconds. Okay, it looks like you're getting off with it. So listen, um, Pavla, um, Hannah, thank you very much for the, the, the time you've taken to give the presentation. You had a good audience, so you had about 75 people at, at the maximum, which is very good. Um, I hope they enjoyed it. I certainly did. You've got a lot of applause happening in the side of the box now. So, listen, thank you very much for taking the time to prepare your presentations and to give it online. In two weeks' time, we have a presentation about um, mutant population generation. So, um, again, please, if you are around, uh, feel free to join us at two o'clock in two weeks' time. I think it was February the 6th, is it? Something like that. Um, two weeks on Thursday. So thanks again. Um, lovely work. Thank you for, yeah, Very thank nice you for having us. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to present. Yeah, it was no, a good experience. Pleasure. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you thanks everybody. Bye. See ya.